Production support for In Focus is provided by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity for Central and Southern Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com and by viewers like you. Thank you. This year, Hoosiers saw gas prices rise higher than ever before. Highways and streets dominate the scope of the state's transportation infrastructure, but that has not stopped Indiana residents from asking what their options might be moving forward. Tonight, we'll discuss the possibility of alternatives, whether the state can't afford them and how or when they could be implemented as we put transportation in focus. Thanks for joining us for this edition of In Focus. I'm Stan Jastrzewski. If you have questions for one of our studio experts during tonight's program, please email them to us at infocus at indiana.edu or call us at 1-800-987-9848. A disruption in a pipeline that carries nearly 600,000 barrels of crude oil to the Midwest every day helped contribute earlier this year to the highest gas prices Indiana has ever seen. While some ditched their automobiles and explored other options, still others had little recourse. Two days a week, Terre Haute resident Jim Wallace commutes 75 miles each way to Mattoon, Illinois, where he spent the past five years as an adjunct astronomy professor at Lakeland College. I have no choice. It's hard to get a job here in this region uh, as faculty because the colleges here aren't really hiring, so we go where the jobs are. Wallace has continued to make the trip, despite record-breaking national gas price averages in 2008, as well as Indiana's record gas price averages, which topped out at $4.25 a gallon on May 4th of this year. And I've had no cost of living increase, so that's money I have to absorb that comes out of my budget for things like electricity and food and, you know, the simple things. AAA Hoosier Motor Club spokesperson Greg Sider says many people have become desensitized to high gas prices. Uh, they're certainly a lot higher than people would like to see right now, but that having been said, I think people are still going to be driving. 96% of all the money that's spent on transportation in the state of Indiana goes into streets and highways. But the state is beginning to look into alternative forms of transportation. INDOT has been reaching out to the public as it develops a new rail plan. Currently, INDOT regulates nearly 4,500 rail miles in Indiana, but few are dedicated to passenger travel. Indiana Transportation Association Executive Director Kent McDaniel says it's critical for Indiana to start investing in passenger rail expansions. It would uh, uh, take an enormous amount of money, but it takes an enormous amount of money to build uh, uh, highways. It takes an enormous amount of money to build uh, parking garages. We need to change the way we look at the world because the world is changing. In the past, Indiana's public transit systems have relied on dedicated funding sources received through state sales tax revenues. However, because of budget shortfalls, this year's state legislature was forced to make the tough decision to eliminate that foundation. The Bloomington Transit Authority, one of Indiana's 67 public transportation systems and one of the largest in the state, serves more than 3 million riders every year. In just a 10-year period, we've tripled our ridership on Bloomington Transit, so more and more people are using public transportation. That's a great thing for the Bloomington community as we're able to hopefully bring get more cars off of the street. Uh, and just make Bloomington a more livable place. Some speculate gas prices could reach the $5 mark later this year. May says he hopes if prices do go that high, people will seriously consider automobile alternatives. If we reach those kind of levels, I think that'll be a catalyst to our elected officials to, to really take a step back and, and think about this and ponder what the possible repercussions of that could be on our economy and our, our transportation infrastructure here. In James Wallace's case, he can't take a bus or rail. He's even investigated the rideshare program, but hasn't been able to find anyone who makes the same trip. In Wallace's case, driving alone is his only option. We'd all would love to have a nice high-speed rail or at least even a low-speed rail to take uh, away our dependence on having to purchase gas and, and all the expenses that go with that. It's very rough on my cars. I'll normally go through a car about every two years. Indiana has the largest number of roads per capita, and as the crossroads of America, it's no surprise. We'll look at Indiana's infrastructure and the potential for growth of highways, railways, and public transportation systems as we put transportation in focus.
And joining us in studio tonight, our Indiana Transportation Association President, Marty Sennett, George Smirk, a professor emeritus with the Indiana University Kelly School of Business, and Bloomington State Representative Matt Pierce. Thanks to the three of you for being here. I, when, you know, when the state leased the Indiana Toll Road a few years ago, we got about $4 billion, just a little less than $4 billion in one lump sum from that. And I'd like to get a response from each of you, and Matt, we'll start with you. Most of that money went towards the major moves road projects that Governor Daniels prioritized the money for. Was that focusing strictly, almost strictly on giving that money to road projects short-sighted, do you think? Well, I certainly think it was, and I think the legislature has really shown a lack of vision when it comes to mass transit. It's very focused on roads. Part of that is because the road building industry has a very strong lobby, and those who want more roads built, roads improved and expanded, they're there every day pushing for that outcome. And what needs to happen is we need to have an even stronger support for mass transit. One of the other things is you have rural legislators who feel that, that mass transit doesn't have any impact for them. They think that's a big city thing, and therefore there's no reason for them to support it. George, what do you think? What about focusing strictly that a large amount of money on just roads instead of branching it out to other forms of transportation? I don't think it was a good idea. Um, first off, it wasn't as much money as it should have been. There's a professor at uh, Notre Dame that said it should have been somewhere around $11 billion to that lease. Like more money to play with. Lord knows we could use improvements in, in, uh, in highways, we could use improvements in a lot of things, but I think the money should have been spread around a little bit more. One thing, we keep hearing this high-speed rail thing, it would be nice just to have a, a decent bus service, then think about the rail a little bit later on. And I say that because it, it, it's, if you come up with it with the premium first, it's very expensive, and it's better off to start small and build. Marty, your thoughts? Well, I think we need to start looking at public transportation as a mode of transportation instead of a uh, social surface. Uh, it's a mode just like uh, rail is, highways. It's got to be a complete balanced system with, uh, with, with all the modes being uh, funded because not everybody fits into a certain pattern. Not everybody can ride a car, drive a car. Right. We don't all have uh, rail systems like they do in northwest Indiana. So we have to find out where those uh, folks fit in. In the last census uh, that we talked about, uh, car ownership, 9% uh, of the people in Tippecanoe County had access to, did not have access to a car, and 30% only had access to one vehicle. So there's plenty of people out there uh, that could benefit from having uh, public transportation. I think you bring up an interesting point, and that is that there are people who, for whom circumstances are difficult, but there's also a mental block, I think, in a lot of people's minds about the money it would cost to build out a transportation system or whether they would use a train versus a bus uh, versus a rideshare program. How do you think, and, and then we'll get responses from the other two of you, how do you think it is possible, if it's possible, to get past these mental blocks that seem to exist around public transportation? Well, I think we have to do a, a better job of looking at alternative analysis. You know, we always talk about subsidized public transit, but we never look at uh, the roads, the amount of subsidy that we deal with roads. And when you figure out all the uh, local dollars, the property tax dollars that go in after the road is built, and you start comparing the cost of the two, I think you'll find that public transit is very competitive in, uh, in the modes of transportation. Is that the sort of thing you would tell your students, George? Yes, yes. Um, uh, I was thinking, as you talked there, Marty, uh, I was thinking of the word intimidation because I, I was reading some clippings today from the Northern Indiana Commuter Transportation District, the South Shoreline, and I was on the board of that railroad for 30 years. And uh, our, the, our marketing director uh, has a quote in his uh, comments to the press saying that People feel intimidated uh, if you're not used to riding the train or the bus, whatever. Uh, what do I do? do I, where do I get on? Uh, and some education, some news, some... Well, we need to be, like Dr. Smirk said, we need to be more multimodal. When I was in his classes many years ago, he said Indiana is multimodal. We have cars and pickup trucks. <laughs> but we need to look beyond that. We need to uh, look at alternatives such as, as light rail, commuter rail, and, and strengthening our bus systems.